shared with us. Today we begin our study in Galatians. Let's look at verses, well, we'll be looking at verses 1 through 9, but I'm going to read verses 1 through 5, and we'll get into our study. Galatians chapter 1, beginning at verse 1, reading to verse 5. Paul, an apostle, not from men, nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the brethren who are with me, to the churches of Galatia. Grace to you and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil age according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. So as we begin our study of Galatians, as is my normal methodology in beginning of studies, I'll give you a brief introduction, some information as I give this introduction that will help you as we look at this particular book. I'll give you some basic things, and then we'll move into uh, the first verse and, and go through the first nine verses. But as we begin, this particular letter, this letter to the Galatians was written somewhere around the year 49. This is the only letter that Paul writes that is addressed to more than one church. I want you to notice that in verse 2. He says, to the churches of Galatia. When you look in a map, Galatia is actually what we today would call modern Turkey. And uh, the people who were there were actually, they were called Gauls. Um, they were from, uh, or Celtic. They were actually from, from Europe, Central Europe, as well as France. And so they're called Gauls, and that's why it's called Galatia. Uh, these, these churches that are being written to were planted on Paul's first mission that he went on with Barnabas, and it's recorded in Acts chapters 13 and chapter 14. Now, there's a reason why he, re, he writes this letter. Every letter that he ever wrote had a purpose, and the purpose for this is very basic. It's a response. It's a response to bad doctrine that has begun to enter into the churches. There are people who have entered in that we're going to recognize as they're referred to now as Judaizers who have entered into the church. They've infiltrated the church. And what they're doing is they're actually adding to the gospel. And as they're adding to the gospel, they're mixing the gospel of grace with the law of Moses. These people were entering in, and you're going to see him as he begins to respond to this doctrine. These people who are entering in began to teach that Gentiles had to first become Jews through circumcision, before they could become Christians, and that one could only become righteous before God if you obey the law of Moses. And so what they were doing is they were mixing the law with the grace of God. And so what Paul is going to do in this particular book is he's going to, he's going to reveal to the Galatians that freedom from the law as we are saved by Jesus Christ is a result of God's grace. God's grace and faith in Jesus alone gives us freedom. And we're free from the law because we have been set free by the grace of God. When you look into this, there'll be some key, ch a key chapter, and we'll see that when we get to chapter 5, because he's going to point out that though we are saved by grace and we are free from the law, we are not given freedom to, to, uh, to just... Uh, live in the flesh, and we'll be seeing that as we get there. Now, this particular letter actually has a note of concern. I didn't read these verses, but in verses 6 and 7, you see his concern. It says, I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another. But there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. And so he begins by saying, I'm concerned for you because these false teachers are trampling the heart of the Christian gospel. And I'm concerned that you are so easily being seduced. You are so easily being led astray. A commentator by the name of Merrill Tenney wrote, Christianity might have been just one more Jewish sect and the thought of the Western world might have been, been entirely pagan had it never been written. Galatians embodies the germinal teaching on Christian freedom, which separated Christianity from Judaism, and which launched it upon a career of missionary conquest. And so this particular book actually gives to us insight into grace, and that's why I chose to entitle our first study, The Gospel of Grace, because that's what Paul is defending. 
Now as we begin here, verse 1, Paul, an apostle, not from men, nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. This is a typical salutation of the apostle Paul. He begins by saying, Paul, an apostle. This is how he normally starts his letter. As a matter of fact, in nine letters that he writes, in those nine letters, he repeats this, Paul, an apostle, in every one of those nine letters. Here he begins this letter in this way because uh, there's a reason, because his authority has been challenged. There are people who are, who are challenging his authority, and that's why he's saying, I am an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, Paul had given the church the gospel of grace. And they had originally embraced the message of God's grace. But false teachers had entered in after he left and, and were bringing in something that we use, the word that we use today to describe it is something called legalism. And legalism is a wrong attitude toward the code of laws under which a person lives. Legalism is a fleshly attitude which conforms to a code for the purpose of exalting yourself. And that's what is taking place here. These people were bringing in legalism, a code of laws that ultimately would exalt themselves because they were uh, going to be capable or they would think of themselves as being capable of actually living in such a way that it would please God. And in doing that, they needed to understand that in my flesh, I can't please the Lord. I need the grace of God and the power of the Holy Spirit in order to be pleasing to Him. So these legalists were entering in, teaching them that you can please God if you, if you undergo circumcision and obey the law of Moses. And in doing so, they were undermining the foundation of grace. And so that's why Paul it begins in this way. They were bringing doubt on his credentials. They're saying basically, the apostle Paul, he calls himself an apostle, but he's not one of the original 12. He wasn't there when the birth of the church occurred. And so that's why he begins by saying, wait a minute, my name is Paul and I'm an apostle. Now that word apostle literally is one who is sent forth with orders, one who has received authority. It normally would apply to the 12 whom were, were called by the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and you see those 12 in, in uh, various portions of Scripture from the four Gospels and the book of Acts. And there were 12 men originally called by Jesus Christ to follow after him. You had Simon, who's called Peter, he, his brother Andrew. James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John. You had Philip and Bartholomew. You had Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector. James, the son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus. You had Simon the Zealot, as well as Judas Iscariot, the one who betrayed the Lord Jesus Christ. These men, except for Judas, were used to form the foundation of the church. Paul has been called the 13th apostle because he was uniquely chosen by God. Well, he wasn't of the original 12, and therefore he needs to defend his apostleship. And that's why he says that he's an apostle. Now notice, not from men nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. And so he's defending his apostleship. Notice he says, not from men. When he says, not from men, it means I haven't been sent out by men. The 12 did not appoint me. The 12 did not recognize me. The 12 did not send me out. He says, not through man, not through some human agency. No human agency appointed me as an apostle. There has been no installment ceremony. I am not receiving my apostleship through going through Apostle 101 classes and, and graduating with the degree of apostle. He's saying, I haven't been selected by the 12. And I didn't go through some classes to be recognized as an apostle. You see, the bottom line is man cannot do anything but recognize what God already has done. And that's why he says in verse 1, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father. Because Jesus Christ, God the Father, they are the ones who call people. God is the one who ordains. Man doesn't. In our, in our church, we have opportunities for me to, as a senior pastor, recognize individuals and give to them certificates that allow them in the state of California to perform certain functions. You have ordination, you have licensing, you have commissioning. And those are three things that the state of California recognizes, which enables an individual to perform marriages and a variety of things that relate to uh, ministry. So the men that I have on staff have received commissions or are licensed, and they're capable of doing things legally. That's why when you get married and one of the men 
performs the function, the ceremony for you, and they sign that certificate, that's a legal document. And in order for that legal document to be signed, the individual who signs it has to have legal credentials. And so the state has a recognition process for an individual, and they usually use those three things, either ordination or commissioning or licensing. The bottom line is, though, all a man can do is recognize that God has called somebody. I don't call anybody into the ministry. That's not my job. I don't look out there and, and see a holy glow on somebody and know beyond a shadow of a doubt that this is a person called from God. Now, I used to think that way as a new believer. I really did. I actually sat close to the pastor when the pastor was preaching, kind of hoping that he'd look down and see that halo effect over my head and know that I was a man called by God. I really did. And I would be up there and hoping that maybe he'll recognize me. Well, I had a, lear a lot to learn. And, and with Paul, Paul would simply say, listen, I wasn't sent by man, and, and, and man isn't the one who, who called me. I, I haven't received my, my calling from man at all. The apostles didn't recognize me in that way. My calling came from God. And so all a human being can do is recognize what God has already done. John the Baptist in John 3, 27 says, a man can receive only what is given him from heaven. In John 15, verse 16, Jesus speaking to his apostles said, you did not choose me, I chose you and ordained you to go and bear fruit, fruit that abides. You didn't choose me, I chose you and I ordained you. So ordination comes from above and that's what Paul is speaking about. He's saying, I'm an apostle, not from men, nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. So these false teachers who are coming into the churches of Galatia, undermining my authority and ministry and challenging, challenging me, saying, well, I wasn't one of the original 12. Well, these who are coming in have their facts wrong because the Lord has called me into the ministry and recognized me. And that's the point he's making. He says in verse 2, and all the brethren who are with me. In other words, I'm not alone. There are others who recognize my authority and therefore are included in this salutation. He says in verse uh, 3, grace to you and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. I always say this too when we look at his letters. I would always remind you that I want you to note grace always comes before peace. You cannot have peace until you experience the grace of God. There are so many people who put it the other way. They want to have peace, and then maybe I'll seek the grace of God. Paul made it very clear theologically, even in his introduction to his letters, that you will never have peace with God, and you will never have the peace of God until you experience the grace of God. Because it all begins and it all ends with grace, unmerited favor. And so he begins with, with a basic salutation, but in reality, he's given a theological insight. It's interesting because he combines the customary Greek greeting, which would be charis, grace to you, with the Hebrew uh, salutation, which would be shalom, or peace. And so he actually takes both the Hebrew and the Greek, but he puts grace before peace so that we'll always understand every one of us in this room and everyone who ever reads the Word, that will always understand that until I have experienced the grace of God, I will never have peace with Him or peace from Him. Grace always comes before peace, and because if I don't have grace, I will never have peace. Romans 5.1 says, We have been justified through faith. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. In John 14.27, Jesus said, peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. I give you my peace and I give you my grace. Now as he's speaking about this, he says grace to you and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil age according to the will of our God and Father. How do you receive peace? How can I have peace with God and peace from God? Well, I receive peace by recognizing that Jesus Christ gave himself for my sin. To the legalist, this sounds too easy. Are you telling me 
it's interesting. I just had a conversation within the last two, three weeks with somebody who basically, this is the gist of the conversation in a sense. It's almost as if the person was saying, are you telling me that grace is all you need? And the answer is yes. That's what the Bible says. God's grace is all I need. God's mercy is all I need. And when I respond properly to his grace, and when I receive his mercy, it actually transforms my life radically because I begin to live as an individual who realizes that though I deserved justice, I obtained grace. I received something I didn't deserve. See, mercy is withholding something I do deserve, but grace is receiving something I don't deserve. So when God gives me his grace, he's actually giving me something that is unmerited. There's nothing in me that charms God, that makes God say, oh, that cute little sinner down there, I think I'll give him some grace. That's not how it works. But a legalist would say, that sounds too easy. That sounds just, just, it's just too good to be true. You really ought to do something to show to show, to prove, to demonstrate that you really are sorry. But the bottom line is, is the things that I do that demonstrates how sorry I am, I am as a result because I have been overwhelmed by the grace of God. I've been overwhelmed by his goodness to me. And it has provoked me to do something which is to give him my life and to live for him to the best of my ability every day not to somehow try and earn cosmic uh, brownie points with God, to somehow get him to owe me something. The Bible says, who has first given to him that he owes you something in return? The fact is, the only thing that I added to salvation would be the sins that I've been forgiven for. The Lord worked in my life, and that's what Paul's speaking about. He's speaking about the grace of God, that God gave his son Jesus Christ he says here, Jesus gave himself for our sins. That is the heart of the gospel. In John chapter 10, verses 17 and 18, Jesus said it like this, The reason my Father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay, down, I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I received from my Father. I lay down my life. Jesus was not murdered. Jesus was not martyred. Jesus yielded up his life. He gave his life. He yielded it voluntarily. Matthew 20, 28 says, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 6, it says, Jesus gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. The heart of the gospel is God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son and that Jesus Christ came to do the will of his Father and he laid down his life voluntarily for us. Paul is dealing with men who are coming into the church saying, well, this Paul is speaking about God's grace, but in order to understand grace, you need to experience law. And if you don't un understand the law, then how can you have a deep appreciation of grace? Therefore, you Gentiles need to receive circumcision. When you receive circumcision and find yourself under the full weight of the law, the yoke of the law, when you see what a terrible burden it is, you're going to understand the grace that comes through Jesus Christ. But in mixing the law with grace, they actually stole the power from the gospel. And Paul's upset about it. You're going to see it in just a moment. You see, Jesus Christ gave himself for us. Notice that. He gave himself for our sins. Jesus was that offering that satisfied his Father's perfect demands. It's the offering. He is the offering who is called the propitiation. The blood of Jesus Christ satisfied Lord, the Lord God's anger towards sin. And as Jesus Christ came and died on that cross for us voluntarily, he demonstrated to us his depth of love for us and the justice of God. 
God's love for you is, a, is an amazing thing. I don't know if you realize it. I don't know if you really ponder that. I don't know if you meditate on it. I don't know if we fully appreciate it. I don't know that we really will until we are in heaven. My children mean everything to me as a father. I love my babies. Two sons and two daughters. My grandchildren, I wish you could have grandchildren without having children. That's how much I love my grandchildren. <laughs> when my Josiah was born, he's seven years old now, my first grandson. Marie and I were with two friends, Randy and Jeanette Walls, and we were having a cup of coffee. We received a phone call from my daughter. Corinne's about to have a baby, Anna said. You need to be here. Now, I knew that she was in the hospital, but I made an assumption that she, having her first baby, would probably be like her mom. Marie took 33 hours until she gave birth. I really got tired, to be honest with you. <laughs> Hurry up. Let's get out. Get with it. What's up? So I'm thinking, well, Corinne went in, you know, just a few hours ago. We get a phone call. If you want to be around when the baby's born, you better get here. So I finished my coffee and um, jumped in the car and made it to the hospital. Well, when we got up to the, the ward where um, the babies were, you know, newborns are and all, Josiah had already been born. We walked in. And as Marie and I and Jeanette and Randy walked in, the nurse walks up to Jeanette Walls and says, your daughter's doing fine. And Jeanette says, that's not my daughter. That's this lady's daughter, and points to Marie. So the nurse says, oh, I'm sorry. Your, your daughter's fine, and the baby's fine. Mama, go on in and see the baby. And, but only one of you can go in, so Mama, go in and see your grandson. And Marie goes, no. She goes, Grandpa's going to go in first, my husband. And the nurse looks at me and kind of smiles, and, and says, he, he can go in in a minute. Grandma, go on in and hold your grandbaby. She tells Marie that a second time. And Marie looks at her and says, no, my husband's going to go in and see his grandson. And the woman looks at Marie and says, no, he can do that in a moment. Grandma, go. And so I strangled her. I mean, right there. I mean, she's dead. I mean, it's over. I mean, shut up. She's giving me orders. <laughs> shut up. So Marie... Marie says, no, my husband's going to go in. And so I go walking into the room, and the nurse couldn't understand that, so she brings Marie in anyway. And, I, you know, she just could not hang with that. I mean, this guy's not supposed to be in here. The grandma's supposed to be in here. But Marie knew how I am. She knows how I am when it comes to my babies. And I walked in there, and there's this bundle of ugly love, <laughs> my daughter, and this beautiful baby. You know? <laughs> and there's this little baby. He was premature, tiny little guy. And Karini's holding him when I came walking in. And I walked in, and Marie's coming in behind me. And my daughter looks up at me, and I'm just looking down at my Josiah, and she hands him to me, and he was so small, I had my hands together like that, and his little head was in my hand. He was so small, he was, he was premature and so tiny, and I turned and I looked at Marie, my wife, and my eyes just burst with tears. I know you can't believe that, it's true. <laughs> And I took this little bundle and I gave him a kiss in his little forehead. And as, as I'm so happy, my, my daughter happened to have her little phone that takes pictures, right? And she got that picture of Papa holding and kissing his grandbaby for the very first time. I have that picture in a little album that she gave to me. I have to tell you, as a father, I would lay my life down, and that's the truth. Every dad would do the same thing 
for my babies. That's not even a question of that. That wouldn't even be, a, you wouldn't even have to ask me. That's a natural, of course. I'd lay my life down for them. My grandchildren, same way. Of course, of course. I've lived a long and happy life. Take mine, let them live. Why, yeah, of course, that, there's no thought about that. But if somebody said to me, you give up your son, you take his life. His life is going to be, he's going to be, he's going to die. Not for good people, but for evil people. Your son, will you give your son for evil people? I would say, no. Like Paul said, for a good man, uh, someone would possibly die for a righteous man. But, but while we were yet sinners, Jesus died for us. See, we were no good. We were no good. If somebody said, this criminal here is going to die unless he gets a transfusion of all the blood from your son so he can live, I'd say, bye. <laughs> I'll do your funeral. <laughs> bye. You have got to be kidding me. This man needs Josiah's heart. No. You cannot have my son. You cannot have my grandson. Are you kidding me? That isn't even something I'd even think about. I'm sorry you're dying. I'll pray for you before you die. But I'm not about to give my child for you. That's what amazes me. Have you gotten it yet? That's what amazes me about my God. While I was yet a sinner, Christ died for me. He gave up his life for me, and I don't deserve it. Of course not. The most precious, precious person in the entire universe gave up his life. Love. Legalism never produces it. Never produces it. The motivation of legalism is never love. It's always activity. Love. That's what we heard earlier today. That's what motivates us to do things for Jesus Christ. Love, not brownie points, not some kind of uh, position. Love. Love causes people to put money away, their own money, and to take vacation time, and to fly to Haiti and care for these babies. It's love that makes them do that. Not some reward they, they are going to get someday in heaven. God does give rewards, but that's not what motivates them. It's the love of Christ. It's the love of God. And, and love, love is the response that we have to a God who first loved us. We love him because he first loved us. Not because I invented love and said, oh, I've always loved you. No, he loved me first. He loved me first. I didn't love him first. Again, using children as an illustration. You have your baby. Corinne being my firstborn. Marie is starting to swell up with child. I'm a first-time dad. I've got no understanding of these things. I've heard about babies kicking and all that stuff. I don't know what that means. I've just heard it. You know, women have a different grip on those things. Me, it's just, I don't know what that means. And she starts to tell me, oh, the baby's kicking. I say, that's cool. I'm kicking too. No, no, the baby's kicking. So I she says, here, and she'd take my hand and, and put it on her, on her little belly there. And, and, and before you know it, I'd feel that little kick. And, and, and I go, wow, you know, that is amazing. She is all active, kicking and everything. And I would, and, and I would put my hand on, on Marie's tummy, and I'd, and I'd shake her. So the baby would get all agitated, and bang, she'd kick me. And I go, all right. And there were times, there were times when she wouldn't kick. And I'd get nervous, and I'd be shaking Marie all over. The place. Get up, talk to me. You know, I'd put my face on Marie's stomach, and I would yell, baby, 
That's the truth, I did. Baby, this is daddy. Daddy's talking to you. And I would do this and I would say, I love you. I would do that. How stupid, huh? <laughs> but I did. I did. I would yell that to her. Baby, I love you. She's born. She comes out with that head all twisted, <laughs> all ugly. They wrap her up. I put that blanket over her face. No. Face that only a daddy could love. Ugly little thing. But it was mine. It's my ugly baby. And I would carry her and hold her and talk to her and love her as I did all of my babies. All of them. All of them. Same way. Carry them, hold them, love them. Took her in to get her first shot. I held her. They pulled her diaper down, jammed that needle in her little bottom. She pulls back and looks me in the eyes like, man, what's up? What did you do that for? <laughs> I cried. The nurse starts to laugh. I had to turn around with tears coming down my face because my baby was crying. I'm real tender with my kids. I love them with all my heart. It's the truth. I love you. And then one day they say, you never loved me. <laughs> Are you kidding me? I don't like you. <laughs> but I sure love you. I've always loved you. I loved you before you even knew you were you. I loved you before you separated that womb. I loved you before I held you in my hands. I loved you from the moment I knew you were there. And now you tell me I never loved you. Are you kidding me? If there's anything you've ever had, always, it's been the love of a father. But you know what? You can do that to God. You can say that to God. You don't love me. Because if you loved me, you wouldn't let this happen to me. No, wait a minute. Father knows best. He knows what he's doing in my life. And if I understand his goodness and his love, I can get through anything. If I, if I can put my head on a pillow at night knowing God loves me, no matter what kind of day I've had, God loves me, I'm going to make it. I will make it. And I have made it because I know beyond anything, truly God is good and truly God loves me. He loves us. And that is what Paul is dealing with when these people are coming into the church saying, well, God's love is great and his mercy is good and, and grace is wonderful, but you've got to do these things in order to, to really have a relationship with God. Well, Paul gets upset because the, they're undermining the relationship of God with his children. And he gets upset about that because it's wrong. God loves us. He gave himself, he's saying concerning Jesus, he gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil age according to the will of our God and Father. Jesus gave himself that he might rescue us. That word deliver speaks of rescuing us from danger. This evil age is a, a death system energized by Satan and is doomed. 1 John 2, 17, the world is passing away and the lust of it, he who does the will of God abides forever. Jesus, Matthew 24, 35, Jesus says, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. In 1 Corinthians 7, 31, Paul says, the form of this world is passing away. He has delivered us from this present evil age, this death system energized by Satan that is doomed. We haven't been removed, but we're kept from its sentence of death, and we live for Jesus Christ, and we're used by God to rescue others. We minister and call people and say to them, God has a way for you. Jesus died on a cross for you to deliver you, to rescue you. Some of us remember that tsunami that hit 
Indonesia and Thailand, that region, it's terrible and devastating. And, and we saw a film where there was somebody on a roof taking a, a video of the wave that was approaching land, traveling as fast as a jet. And when a tsunami hits, what happens is the wave, as it's building, well, the water on the shoreline begins to recede. It begins to be drawn towards the ocean. And this man is on a, on a rooftop with his camera, and he's taking a film of the, and you can see this huge wave in the distance coming towards the land. But the, but the water that is normally there on the shoreline has receded, you know, quarter mile out or further. And there's a man who sees all these fish just flopping around. They've been left behind. And he has a basket. And he's there running after the fish, grabbing fish and putting them in his basket, thinking, oh, man, I've got all this fish I can eat later on. It's just there. But you hear the man on the roof screaming to the man who's there below. He has a, a, a bird's eye view. He sees the wave. And he's screaming. For the man, run for your life, run for your life. And the man is so busy picking up fish, he doesn't see when the wave hits him. And you see that. You see this man's film as the wave hits it. And some people don't know this about tsunamis. They have picked up all kinds of trash and things on the bottom of the ocean. And it's like being inside of a, of a blender. When it hits you, there's so much inside the wave that chops you up, you are actually blended to death instantly. It's not a drowning that takes place. You are torn apart. And this man is up there screaming, get off, leave, run for your life. That's a Christian. That's a good picture of a Christian. The wave is coming. You're going to be destroyed but you're so busy picking up fish, you don't even realize your life is in danger. And the Christian has the bird's eye view looking down saying, it's coming. That's what Paul is speaking about when he says he delivered us. He rescued us from this present evil age. That's what we do as ministers of the gospel when you say, come to Christ, turn from your evil ways. Open your heart to the grace of God. He loves you. Be saved. And so that's what he's speaking about. He delivers us. But what's going on? Well, notice verse 6. I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another. But there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let them be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than what you have received, let him be accursed. I marvel that you're turning away so soon, he says in verse 6. That word marvel, I am bewildered and astounded. I cannot believe that you're turning so quickly from the truth of the gospel. I cannot believe that you are deserting God and his grace. Now, he's not surprised by what the false teachers are saying and doing. He's surprised at how quickly and easily the church is deceived. That gives us insight, by the way, into how powerful deception really is. You see, Paul outside of Jesus, was the greatest teacher in the history of the church, yet they're readily rejecting the truth communicated to them by him. They are being hoodwinked. They are drifting from their moorings. He speaks of them turning away. When he speaks of turning away, that means to fall away or desert. It could be deserting a person. It could be deserting a thing. It, it actually is a word that can be used of military desertion. They're not being removed by others. That's what amazes him. You are willingly removing yourself. You are voluntarily leaving the sphere of grace 
so that you can begin to pursue legalism, and that's what bothers him. You see, that con continues to happen to this day, by the way. There are, there are those who will say, well, I have the pure and the original gospel, and you need to listen to what we have to say. That those who follow that kind of teaching are, are people who, who seem to say things like, well, tell me what I'm supposed to believe. In, a, in other words, think for me and tell me how I should think. Somebody who um, approached me on one occasion said to me, Pastor, I want to ask you a question. What do we believe about this? And my answer was, I know what I believe about that, but you have to determine what you believe about that. See, my job isn't to believe for you. Your job is to believe for yourself. You know, when Marie and I were uh, starting to date and she was newly uh, following the Lord, one of the things that we had a conversation about very early in our relationship was this. I said, listen, I don't have enough faith for the both of us. I cannot carry you on my back. I only have enough faith for myself. And so you're going to need to develop a walk with God that is your own. You cannot be relying on me to believe for you. You have to have a walk with God of your own. Because I am not supposed to lord it over people's faith. I'm supposed to be a helper of their joy. Because by faith, they stand. Each one of us stands before God individually, in other words. And so Paul is saying, you are deserting voluntarily the grace of Christ. These false teachers are saying, follow our God guidelines. If you do what I say, you're going to be right with God. To desert the gospel of grace is more than to desert a doctrine. To, to desert the gospel of grace is to desert God himself. He says, I marvel that you are turning so soon from him who called you. The Judaizers who had invaded the church were claiming to be Christians. They were claiming to recognize Jesus as the Messiah. They recognized the necessity of his death on a cross. If not, they wouldn't have been able to share. But their problem was, is they're trying to improve on the gospel and thus destroying grace. So what they're doing is they're adding a dimension knowledge of the law, and again, undermining the grace of God. Because when the law is added, grace ceases being grace, and it begins to be what we would call a false gospel. Notice verse 7, how he says, which is not another. It is not another of the same kind because it's not a message of grace. By adding works to salvation, the good news becomes the bad news. Again, some cannot fathom that God forgives every single one of their sins by his grace. They cannot fathom that. They forget. God, forgi God forgives you. Everyone. Every one of your sins. And you want to know something about the Lord? Let me share something with you that really ministers to me. He doesn't bring it up to you. Once it's done, it's done. You know how there's sometimes people who will say, I forgive you, but I'm not going to forget? Some guy was talking about his wife, and he says, man, when we get in an argument, she gets all historical. <laughs> and his friend says, you mean hysterical? He says, no, historical. She brings everything up from the past. <laughs> God doesn't do that. Aren't you glad? Are you not glad? I am glad that God doesn't do that. Oh, Lord, please forgive me. No, wait a minute. I forgave you 27 minutes and 30 seconds ago because you said this or did this, and you're asking me again? He doesn't do that. He doesn't do that. You know, my kids can tell you this is true about us in our relationship. If my kids have done something or had done something wrong and they were to come up to me and say to me, Dad, I'm sorry. Forgive me. I don't bring it up to him again. It's over. It's done. It's under the blood. It's been forgiven. This isn't something we're going to talk about again. It's over. It's done. I don't bring it back up. Why? Because God doesn't bring up my sins. Because he doesn't remind me of what I've done. If it's been forgiven, it's forgiven. Let's move on. I used to tell my kids when they were small, 
at the end of the day, sometimes they weren't as good as I would have liked them to have been. But I would tell them sometimes at the end of the night, you know what's a blessing? Is tomorrow's a new day, and we can start over again tomorrow. Every day is a new day. God's mercy is new every morning. Every morning. Because I use up all of his mercy that day. So I need some more tomorrow. And God renews, and God renews, and God renews. This is the God I serve, a God who loves me, a God who forgives me of my sins. In Isaiah 118, Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Isaiah 43, 25, I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. Psalm 103, 12, as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Saved by grace, the wonderful grace of God, totally unmerited. The Bible says, it is by grace that you've been saved through faith, and this not from yourselves. It's a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. But he says in verse 7, there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. There are some who are stirring you up, who are agitating. They're unsettling your minds. They're stirring your emotions. That is always the result of false teaching. There will be a lack of peace. Your relationship with God is going to be shaken. Your faith is going to be shaken. And so he says, if we are an angel from heaven, should come and give you another gospel. If we should preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, well, let them be accursed. As we've said before, so now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than what you have received, let him be accursed. Now, I want you to see verse 8. We're going to close with this, these two verses. Even if we or an angel from heaven, if I change my message, may I be lost. But if an angel from heaven brings a different message, let him be accursed. An angel from heaven, different message. All you need to do is listen to a young Mormon tell you the testimony that he has. All you have to do is listen to the young Mormon and the angel Moroni who appeared and brought this new insight to their prophet leader, Joseph Smith, who brought a different gospel. All you need to do is do a little reading on Islam, how that Muslims believe that Gabriel gave revelation to Muhammad. An angel. When you, when you go to Israel, there is a, a, an area there in Jerusalem we go to. It's called the, um, the Temple Mount. And on the Temple Mount, you have the Al-Aqsa Mosque, and you also have the Dome of the Rock, one of the most holy sites in the Muslim faith. And we go up there. We've been up there numerous times in, over the years. And, and people will say, can we go into the Dome of the Rock? And, and my answer has always been the same. They do permit it if you'd like. You can go in. They ask me, are you going to go in, Pastor? And I've been to Israel, I think, 20 times. And, and I say, no, I, I don't go in. Well, why not? Wouldn't you like to go in and see it? And I say, no, not really. Well, why not? Well, there is a founding inscription inside the building that is written in classical Arabic. It's from the Quran, chapter 4, 171. And it says this, O you people of the book, overstep not bounds in your religion, and of God speak only the truth. The Messiah, Jesus, son of Mary, is only an apostle of God and his word which he conveyed unto Mary and a spirit proceeding from him. Believe therefore in God and his apostles and say not Trinity. It will be better for you. God 
is only one God, far be it from his glory that he should have a son. That is a blasphemous statement regarding Jesus Christ. And I've been asked, why don't you go in? And that's why. Why would I enter in when it is centered on a denial of the God of grace? It is built on the denial of a loving God who gave his son for me. Paul was dealing with error that crept in in the early history of the church that has continued to creep in and influence people over the centuries. And Paul said, if I or an angel of God should give a message that is different than the gospel of Jesus Christ, may we be accursed, may we be anathema, may we be doomed to destruction. False teachers are marked, avoided, their teachings are rejected, and they are left, he's saying, to God's judgment. The gospel of grace must stand. It's a gospel that is built on the gracious love of God for us, a God who sent his son for us.